Hello, my name is Lauren Brent Mitchell, and uh, it's my pleasure today on behalf of the primary and secondary panels of the Canadian Cardiovascular Society Atrial Fibrillation Guidelines Committee to highlight for you, in as brief a time as possible, the perioperative management of anticoagulation in patients with atrial fibrillation. First, of course, my disclosures. I have received research support. I have received honoraria. I have spoken on behalf of, and I have received consulting fees from Boringer Ingelheim, the makers of Dabigatran, and from the BMS Pfizer Canadian Alliance, the makers of Apixaban. Importantly, I've also served on the CCS Atrial Fibrillation Guidelines Committee, so I do take their recommendations to heart. Today's agenda is to discuss four decision-making points that are of importance when managing patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation who are anticoagulated and about to undergo a procedure. The questions we'll address are, should the anticoagulant be discontinued? If so, when? If so, when should that anticoagulant then be restarted? And if so, should the period of time without active oral anticoagulant therapy be bridged with subcutaneous or intravenous anticoagulation? As is true at every point that we make decisions regarding an anticoagulated patient, there is always a balance of bleeding risk and thromboembolism risk. The bleeding risk, of course, we estimate with the HASBLED score, where H stands for hypertension, A for abnormal kidney or uh, liver function, the S for stroke, uh, the B for past history of bleeding or bleeding tendency, the L for labile INRs in patients on warfarin, the E for elderly, defined as greater than or equal to the age of 65, a definition that I take as a personal affront and the D stands for drug or alcohol. With respect to the periprocedural management of such a patient, of course, we also must consider the procedure that the patient is about to undergo. As you're well aware, thromboembolism risk is, is uh, measured by the CHAD score with particular emphasis on the occurrence of a recent thromboembolic event, a patient with a mechanical heart valve or the patient with rheumatic mitral stenosis. So the first guideline that exists in this area is the motherhood guideline that says we must consider these two competing risks when making decisions regarding patients with anticoagulant therapy. Particular to the periprocedural considerations are what procedure is the patient about to undergo. Uh, the procedures are divided into those with low and very low bleeding risk, high bleeding risk, and intermediate bleeding risk. This is just a partial list. I'm not going to go through it. A complete list that is updated regularly is to be found on the Thrombosis Canada website where there are some excellent tools to guide management decisions in this area. I would draw your attention though to the first three and the last two on this list. Most dental procedures, most dermatologic procedures, most ophthalmologic procedures, coronary angiography and cardiac device implantation are all low and very low bleeding risk procedures. High bleeding risk procedures are those things that we would expect to be high bleeding risk. I draw your attention to the last two pericardiocentesis and biopsies of vascular tissue are considered high bleeding risk procedures. And of course everything else will be in between. I draw your attention again to the website on the bottom of the slide that reminds you that Thrombosis Canada can provide you with some very excellent tools. The recommendations in this area include that we suggest that interruption of anticoagulant therapy, particularly the vitamin K antagonists, in a bleed in, or in a patient with atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter is not necessary for most procedures with a low risk of bleeding, such as cardiac device implantation or most dental procedures. This is a conditional recommendation with moderate quality evidence. The only caveat with respect to this recommendation is that 
cardiac device implantation surgery has only been well studied with respect to vitamin K antagonism. Uh, the novel or non-vitamin K antagonist uh, oral anticoagulants are presently being studied in this area uh, and so the recommendation does not yet apply in that arena. We also recommend that the interruption of anticoagulant therapy in a patient with atrial fibrillation or flutter will be necessary for most pre procedures with an intermediate or high risk of major bleeding. Now a strong recommendation but still admittedly based on low quality evidence. So how long should the agents be stopped in preparation for surgery? If one has taken the decision that these agents are to be discontinued, then aspirin, clopidogrel, prazogrel, or ticagrelor are usually stopped for five to seven days. On the other hand, for procedures with a very high risk of bleeding, then the recommendation would be for discontinuation of these agents for seven to 10 days. For warfarin therapy, the recommendation is to discontinue for five days and proceed with surgery when the INR is under 1.5 for low risk bleeding procedures or under 1.2 for those procedures where discontinuation of warfarin therapy is really truly indicated the intermediate or high risk bleeding procedures. We recommend that when warfarin, aspirin or clopidogrel therapy has been interrupted for an invasive procedure that such therapy should be restarted when hemostasis is established. That usually means restarting the agent one to two days after a procedure with a low risk of bleeding or two to three days after a procedure with an intermediate or high risk of bleeding, a conditional recommendation with low quality evidence. With respect to apixaban, dibigatran or rivaroxaban, if they have been withdrawn for an invasive procedure, we suggest that such therapy be restarted one day after hemostasis is established. The reason for the slight delay with these agents is of course that their anticoagulant effect is near immediate, whereas the other agents in the previous recommendation take time to reach their anticoagulant levels. Again, a conditional recommendation with low quality evidence. Uh, when one of the non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants is to be discontinued for a procedure, we recommend that for apixaban and for rivaroxaban that the agents be discontinued one to two days prior to a procedure that has a low risk of bleeding and two to three days prior to a procedure that has an intermediate or high risk of bleeding. Dibigatran, on the other hand, is exquisitely sensitive to renal excretion, so the recommendations are a little more complex. If the estimated creatinine clearance in your patient is greater than 80 mils per minute, then the recommendations are the same as those listed above for apixaban or rivaroxaban. If the estimated creatinine clearance is in the range of 50 to 80 mils per minute, we recommend using the upper number of the range listed above. If the estimated creatinine clearance is between 30 and 50 mils per minute, we recommend adding one more day to the range discussed above. And if the estimated creatinine clearance is less than 30 mils per minute, add one more day yet, which would of course be a total of two days. We then recommend that if a decision or when a decision has been made to interrupt warfarin therapy for an invasive procedure, that bridging with low molecular weight heparin or ultrafiltrated heparin be instituted when the INR is below the therapeutic level only in those patients at the highest risk of thromboembolic events. That is, patients with a CHAD score greater than or equal to four, used to be three in our previous recommendations, patients with a mechanical valve, patients with a transient ischemic attack or stroke in the previous three months, or patients with rheumatic heart disease. This new recommendation further limiting the use of bridging therapy is predicated on the results of uh, recent studies such as the bridging trial and uh, meta-analyses of other observational trials in this area. If one is to use bridging therapy after warfarin therapy has been discontinued, then this slide just highlights how that might be accomplished. Before the procedure, usually five days in advance, the warfarin is stopped. When the INR is less than therapeutic, uh, 
alternative anticoagulant therapy is prescribed, and the low molecular weight heparin, if chosen, would be stopped 24 hours before the surgical procedure, ultrafiltrated he heparin four to six hours before the procedure. After the procedure, particularly after hemostasis has been achieved, the low molecular weight heparin or ultrafiltrated heparin and the warfarin therapy is then restarted one day after a surgical procedure with a low bleeding risk or two to three days after a surgical procedure with an intermediate or high bleeding risk. When low molecular weight heparin is used, the prophylactic dosages are employed for the first two days. Then the therapeutic dosages are used until the INR is therapeutic, at which time warfarin is continued alone. With respect to the non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants, we recommend that bridging is not necessary. And this is because the pharmacokinetics of these agents are sufficiently predictable that one knows when surgery can proceed. So, a strong recommendation with moderate quality evidence that bridging is not necessary when this sort of anticoagulation is being discontinued in the perioperative procedure. I hope this has been useful to you. Thank you for your attention.